two years ago, Kristen came to my office one day, and she had visited her nephew school in Warren County and had said, we have to do this Leader in Me program. It is um, absolutely amazing, and it empowers students to um, kind of be in charge of, their, of themselves and their education. And so we started researching it, and we were like, well, we don't have any money to do this. And so we kind of put it on the back burner, and we talked about it several times. And we both had the book, and I think Chris Gaddis, Chris Gaddis, where are you? Chris Gaddis had actually given the book to the counselors to read maybe that year. I think that was it. So we were we were very excited about trying to figure out how we could do this. So last Christmas, right before Christmas, we found out that there was going to be a Leader in Me symposium in Bowling Green. And so we just decided that we were going to go to it, find out more about it, and then we would go from there. And so we were really, really lucky because we got to go to the symposium and after you visit a school that is doing Leader in Me and it is actually a site visit school for you to see, they've been doing it for a couple of years, it totally sells you. And so we were convinced after we went to the symposium that we were going to come back and somehow figure out how to do it. It was just a, mat a matter of money. And so then we got really, really lucky because our district received the Race to the Top grant. And I kept emailing Matthew Constance saying, this would be perfect for the Race to the Top grant with the leadership component. And I believe it was in late March that we found out that the leader in me was part of the Race to the Top grant. So we lucked out because the Race to the Top grant is helping all of our elementary schools this year and next year in the middle school implement the leader in me program. So it was, it was kind of bittersweet that we um, were able to, to go ahead and get started because we were, after we saw it, we were very passionate about it. And it's just been phenomenal just in the 12 weeks that we have already implemented the Leader in Me, some of the things that we have seen. And tonight what we would like to do is share those things that we've learned so far. We're still in an initial stages of the Leader in Me. But the things that we've done so far, we feel like have had a profound effect on our students and on ourselves and on our school. So we're very excited about that. But the first thing that I would like to do is introduce to you the, lab, the Lighthouse team. And the Lighthouse team is actually a group of teachers or um, staff members that have dedicated their time and energy to helping, after we had the initial training, to actually implement some of the Leader in Me components. And so these ladies work really, really hard and meet after school a lot when, when they're really tired. And I would like to recognize them very quickly. We have Ms. Casey Zorn. And Casey's a new teacher this year. She's a first grade teacher. But the great thing about Casey is that she actually um, participated in the Leader in Me program last year with Eastview. So she came with some vision and some with ex some experience. We have Ms. Jamie Self, our curriculum facilitator. Ms. Self is out in the audience. And um, Ms. Self had also read the Leader in Me book, and I think she kind of feels the same way that Kristen and I had felt about it. And then we have our true Leader in Me, Kristen Tynes, and she has been tirelessly and effortless. She has put so much effort into um, the program already that I just can't say enough. We have painted bathrooms. We have, she spent hours and hours at school in Today she was running around. We had our second Sharpen the Saw session, and you're, you'll learn a little bit more about that, but that couldn't happen without Ms. Tynes. I just can't thank you enough for all of your hard work. And then we have Ms. Tiffany Hoffman. Ms. Hoffman's out in the audience. She's a kindergarten teacher and has a lot of vision and always puts kids first, and that's what, that's what you want on the Lighthouse team. And then we have two members that are back at school with your children. Ms. Carrie Cobert, one of our fourth grade teachers, and Ms. Lorraine North. And so the Lighthouse team has created a plan of how we are going to implement the Leader in Me for the next three years. And we present that plan, and then it's our job to make sure that those things are happening. And one of the things that we talked about in our first Lighthouse team building experience was that we need to educate parents on the seven habits, because that's our big initial focus this first year. So tonight, what we would like to do is introduce you to the seven habits and we have students here that are going to help us with that. So 
I'm going to turn the program over to Ms. Tynes. And Ms. Tynes, are you ready? initiative at Sutton. You may have tuned in for his sports report at our morning news, seen him out front putting up the American flag, or walking the school grounds with the grounds crew cleaning up our campus. It is my pleasure to introduce Jay Crabtree, a true Sutton leader. Thank you, Ms. Tynes, and thank you parents for coming out to our first ever Leader Me Family Night. I'm excited to be a part of this night. We'll be sharing a piece of the leader me and teaching you the seven habits. The seven habits have become a big part of the everyday life of each Sutton student. Tonight you're going to learn the habits in many of the same ways that we have. I'd like to introduce two fellow Sutton leaders, Walker Gaddis and Whitley Ford. Walker is a kindergarten leader in this graduate class. He is, a he is a leader in every way. From day one, Walker was excited about learning the seven habits. Rumor has it that he has already been teaching his family. Willie is a first grade leader in Mrs. Thompson's class. Willie is a firm believer that readers are leaders and always needs when she is when her classwork is complete. She has also taken home what she has learned about the seven habits and often uses her knowledge to help her brother solve problems. 
Walker and Weber will begin the introduction of each habit by showing you the hand sign that we've learned to help us remember each one. Leaders? Being proactive means that you take charge of yourself. You're in charge of your choices and no one can make them for you. In guidance, we have had a lesson about the idea of being proactive instead of reactive. It gave us a visual of what we may look like in a reactive state. Watch the following video of third grade leader Camille Devine reteaching a lesson to some kindergarten students. <laughs> when I grow up, and it's also have to be healthy and strong. Learn respect. I'm being a teacher. 
I'm listening to my teacher really hard, and I'm studying and working and doing the best I can. I'm wearing a teacher outfit. Van, Rachel Roberts. I am wearing a scientist suit because that's, that's what I want to be when I grow up. I'm looking at commercials for for them to and to, for me to entertain and to make me get interested about science and about experiments. Dolphin trainer outfit. Um, I went to Chicago's aquarium and I just had it in my mind that I wanted to be it when I grow up. I'm wearing my football uniform. I want to be an NFL football player when I grow up. I'm going to football practices all the time. Listen to my coach. I'm going to be a secretary because the women are so pretty and I love to work on the computer. You get to work for people and I like to work in a, in a room. I love to and I love to dress nice. I'm wearing a chef costume because that's what I want to be when I grow up. I'm helping my mom cook food and I watch cooking shows. I can exercise and I can eat healthy food so I can get strong and I can save my money so I can grow up and be a doctor. A guidance counselor because I want to help people when they grow up. Um, listen, listen and learn how to help people. I'm wearing a clown outfit because um, it really inspires you because you can be this when you grow up and like you can help people and make them feel happy. I can learn some new jokes and I can learn how to juggle. Uh, United Summer Uniform because it expresses me and I would really like to do it. Well, I practice a lot at home and like I start I start do, doing a lot of leagues and stuff. I'm wearing a president costume because I want to be a president when I grow up, the first woman president. I can get all my homework done. I could do all my habits and I could listen and read, because the more you read, the smarter you get. I am just like a college professor, because I want to be a college teacher when I grow up. I'm going to teach science and times. I am coming to school every day and learning new stuff. I'm wearing my motorcycle gear for, um, I ride motorcycles, so I think I've already um, made some choices about that to um, depend on my future. Riding motorcycles. I, I want to be a detective when I grow up. I'm reading lots of mystery books. Habit three, but first things first, is discussed very often at school. We talk about the importance of doing schoolwork before we have recess, as well as our chores at home before playing. But the busy lives that we live these days, it is easy to forget what the most important things actually are. I'm sure you can relate to my family's busy schedule. How do we make things that, how do we make sure that we attend, that we are attending to the most important things? Check out, check out this clip starring fourth grade leaders, Kaylee Colbert and Carrie Hagerman, as they help us visualize our, our priorities and teach us the importance of putting first things first. Hi, my name is Kaylin. I'm going to tell you, I mean, we are going to tell you about habit number three. Put first things first from the seven habits by Stephen Covey.
And now we're going to show you a project about rocks. The big rocks represent the most important things in your life, like school, your community, friends, and family. These little rocks represent the things that aren't so important, like video games, iPods, and things, and electronics, but not just electronics and other stuff too. So we're gonna put the little rocks in first. Okay, now we're gonna put in the little rock, I mean the big rocks. And you see that there's not enough room for the big ones that are most important. So we need to take some of our little, our little not so important things out. Now we're going to put in the important things like family, community, school, and friends. Now that we have room for all the important things, we can fill in some of our, some of our not so important things. See how it's all nice and flat? That's how we can put, that's how we can put first things first. And that is how you put first things first. Have it for think win win. You win, I win, we win. Habit four, think one win. In relationships, people often have the mentality that if someone wins, the other person has to lose. This type of competition takes away from relationships. Think win-win means that you always want what's best for everyone involved. So fourth grade leader, Ella Bratcher, has a story to share as a family example of win-win. Miss Tons taught us to think about winning as being happy. If you are part of a team, practice good sportsmanship and have fun. You are a winner. Even in win-lose situations such, such as an as athletics, there are things you can do to help create a win-win spirit. Sandra's story can be found in the book Seven Habits of Highly Effective Families on page 186. When our family included infants to teenagers, it was hard to find an activity that everyone could enjoy. Sometimes we would go bowling. All could participate at the level they were at. But the winners were always the same people, the larger, stronger, and more skilled. We tried to figure out a way that it could become a win for everyone and finally found a system that worked. Instead of, a, instead of adding up individual scores and having the person with the most points win, we added up total of everyone's scores. We set an arbitrary goal of so many points we had to reach in order to win as a family. If we met the goal, we would be able to have ice cream sundaes or root beer floats or banana splits as a reward for meeting our goal. So instead of getting upset when someone else had a strike or did much better when we were cheering, cheering all of us to do our best and so our points would add up to our goal. This became a win-win for the entire family and a very synergetic solution. Instead of having winners and losers, we hoped each person would do his or her best. We cheered each other on. We had a common goal. One extra point would make the difference in going out for pizza or ice cream instead of going home. Five, 
seek first to understand, then to be understood, is all about being an effective listener. Stephen Covey teaches that teaches we teaches that we should listen with the intent to understand, not with the intent to reply. He shares in his book most mistakes with family members. Most mistakes with family members are not the result of a bad intent. It's just that we really don't understand. We don't see clearly into some into one another's heart. Listen to me. Listen with me as Stephen explains to us the importance of being empathetic listeners. Too often, we listen to others with the intent to reply. Empathic listening is an altogether different way of being. It is listening with the intent to understand, with the intent to get to the bottom of an issue. It's one of the most important habits any leader can practice. It's the key to effective results in interpersonal relationships, in teams, and in organizations. When we listen empathically, we try to understand the other's point of view with no judgment, with no preconceived end in mind. We simply seek to understand. We temporarily suspend our view long enough to see the world through their eyes. Only people who are secure enough with themselves, those with a firm grasp of the private victory, have the capacity to listen in this way. It's important to note that empathic listening is not about agreeing or disagreeing. It's not about solving or fixing or figuring someone out. It's simply about understanding another's point of view and feelings. Watch what happens when you listen with the sole intent to understand. just teamwork and cooperation, synergy is creative teamwork, creative cooperation. Something new is created that is not there before. Synergy is celebrating differences and being open-minded. Covey teaches that in order to synergy to, to happen in the family, you must also you must follow these two simple rules. Rule one, value one another. Rule two, recognize strengths. Using synergies it is equally important at home as it is at the school. Second grade reader, leader, Roxy Pickford from Miss Neely's class is going to share how they practice synergy to complete a recent classroom pro project. Uh, my, I am Roxy Rickard and I am a second grade leader at Sutton. My class recently worked as teams to build, to build bird castles. These castles will provide food and shelter for the birds that visit our outdoor classroom. That's cool. Together, wait. At times, working together was challenging, but our class has a strong belief that together is better. Watch as my friends share with you what it is like working in this project. Thank you. Hello, this is our bird castle. We're going to make a castle for the birds so we're out in the Sun Elementary's um, garden and we're going to see if, if the weather changes it and we're going to see if birds get in there or not and if birds eat the seeds or not. Here's a quick look at the castle and Austin want to take over and, re and say some stuff about it. Yeah. We made we put it put on here bro. the birds are going to eat it. And when it gold, I, they could get in it. Go, they don't get gold. Synergize is where there is more than one person helping. If you work together, that's better than working by yourself because it's easier to do it with a team. We were um, synergizing, and synergize means working together is better, and we. We're doing, we were being a teamwork. This is where the boys, this is where the boys sit, Santa. This is the little pool. That's the back door. And this is like, when it's in with the walk in this way on the front door. 
what this is. We work together to make the castle. We made this out of cardboard and put icing and bird seeds on it. And we kind of put some tape around here so it would stay. A door to like go in a princess's room. But it's at, and there's actually some food in it for the birds to eat. Then we use a jar and inside it right here so we could put flowers in it. If we weren't um, in a group, we can get it done faster. Synergize is when you work together and if you synergize, you'll get the work done. If you work together, you'll get the job done better. Sideways, turn, turn. Help me, help me. We're Habit seven, sharpen the saw, means to take care of yourself and your family. When your family takes time to sharpen the saw, they renew together. You'll be happier, more successful family through the years. The four basic needs in this area are physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. It's important that we address each area. Please watch Stephen Covey, the brains behind the seven habits, as he explains the concept of sharpening the saw. Sharpening the saw represents your commitment to preserve and enhance the greatest asset you have, you. Whether or not we sharpen the saw affects the quality of our work, our productivity, our overall sense of satisfaction in life. It affects the quality of our relationships and the quality of our decision making. Sharpening the saw has four dimensions, the body, the mind, the spirit and the heart, or our relationships with others. You may have noticed on Wednesdays around our building that um, our teachers and our staff members are dressed a little differently. Um, that is um, something that we're just beginning called Wellness Wednesday. And as a staff, we are encouraging each other to sharpen our saw. So when you see staff members dressed down or dressed in some specific um, shirt or exercise clothes or something like that, it's because they are making a commitment to sharpen their saw that day. So a lot of times we like to put teachers on the spot in the morning news and bring them in and say, what are you doing to sharpen your saw? We see that you've dressed down today. So um, that's something that you like to see. I would like to say thank you to Jay for doing such an outstanding job. He's such an awesome leader. And all the other leaders that are here tonight, Walker and um, Whitley as well, as well as Roxy. So they are doing a really great job, and I appreciate them. One of the goals of tonight's program was to teach you all the seven habits. We want you to be familiar with that language that your kids are coming home and using. We want you to feel comfortable incorporating the principles in your family time. To help your family begin your own journey with the seven habits, we are going to send each of you home with a copy of the Seven Habits of Highly Effective Families. They're on your table, but if you just leave them be for a few minutes, that would be appreciated. Um, it's my hope that each of you all will find at least just a small piece um, of the program to help your family function more effectively. I want you to pay close attention to the importance Stephen Covey places on a family mission statement. On the first page of the book, on the first page of the book, he states. Good families, even great families, are off track 90% of the time. The key is that they have a sense of destination. They know what the track looks like, and they keep coming back time and time again. Stephen compares a pilot's flight plan to family life. 
Like a pilot who runs into bad weather and is forced to change course, doesn't matter if we or a family are off target or if our family's a mess for that matter. The hope lies in the vision, in the plan, and in the courage to keep coming back time and time again. The purpose of a family mission statement is to keep each family member focused on a common goal or purpose. This mission statement should guide a family in making choices and help them regain focus when they find themselves off track. When we meet again for family night number two in February, we will be providing you the tools to create your own display of your family mission statement. As you begin reading the book, be sure to take notes and discuss with each family member what is important to them no matter how small they may be. We have just begun to dip into the new initiative. More than once, we've been encouraged to go slow now so that we can go faster later. This first year in our Leader and Me process, each grade level has taken on a different component. Check out a few things that our fourth graders are working on. I'm Reese and I'm teaching the seven habits. I am so glad that Sutton is teaching and living out the seven habits. We all need to learn and be proactive, have a plan and balance. I have learned so much about balancing my life. In fourth grade, we are striving to be leaders of our school. Some ways we do that are through our leadership jobs and data notebooks. I'm Emily and I'm doing the leadership jobs. We start leadership jobs so we can be a better leader in our school. It helps us be responsible and gives us a chance to help our teachers. It is a win-win. We are happy and they are happy. They can't do it in by themselves. themselves. I am Evie and I'm going to be teaching you about data notebooks. In our data notebooks, we collect our own data for multiplication, fluency, behavior, and AR. We keep these charts in our notebooks so we can see our growth. This gives the parents a chance to look also. The behavior log was tricky. I thought it was to write all of the bad things I do. Really, you are supposed to find out what you are having trouble with and make and make a plan so you can be successful. For example, if I keep forgetting to do my homework, I would make a plan to play for one hour, then then come in and do my home, homework. It becomes a win-win. Jazz set a goal for herself to learn the seven habits in sign language. She even made a personal request to share her accomplishment with our students during the morning assembly. Even with over 400 people packed in our gym, you could have heard a pin drop when Jazz was speaking. She is an outstanding young leader, and I'm very proud to have her share with you tonight, Jazz. leaders from our Sutton dance class and special thanks to Mrs. Yoska and Mr. Harrison for their guidance in creating this and um, they will be performing the Leader in Me Cup song. <laughs> 